Great. Awesome. I'm glad it's being recorded. Hi, my name is Ben Conway. I'm the lead pastor of Tree of Life Church in Dagenham in Essex. I'm the founder of the Tree of Life Network, which is a family of churches, and uh, we're planting churches all over the UK. And I've got big dreams. I've got dreams to plant churches well beyond and outside the reach of the UK as well. But this is session one of a, a new module for leadership training, and the whole, the whole module is called Growing Up. Okay, so this is session one of growing up. Richard Wallace decided to join us again in his car. So I'm just going to mute him and uh, spotlight myself. Bless him. There we go. There we are. Awesome. So don't, don't worry about that. Pay attention. Okay. So this session, the first session is called locate yourself, locate yourself. We all understand growing up that that whole concept of growing up makes sense to us because we've all had to do it on a physical level, okay? You know, you have a baby and the baby learns new skills, and the baby gets bigger and the baby grows in stature, the baby gets stronger. We've all seen that, okay? We all understand the process of growing up. Now we all understand as well, again, I'm talking to leaders, I'm not gonna um, go over what I consider foundational concepts, okay? We all understand spirit, soul, and body here. That a human being is a spirit with a soul in a body. We all understand that. And uh, I hope you all understand that when you get born again as a Christian, you do not need to grow up spiritually. You don't need to grow up spiritually at all because your born again spirit is perfect. It's full of love and joy and peace. It's just like Jesus. It's got all the wisdom, all the knowledge, all the maturity. It's complete in Christ. It doesn't need anything. You have all the wisdom you need in your spirit. You have all the love you need in your spirit. Your spirit looks just like Jesus, okay? So in the spirit, we don't need to grow up. Now in my body, I don't need to grow up. I'm, I've reached full height. I'm not gonna get any taller, okay? If I get bigger, I'm gonna get bigger that way. So I don't wanna get any bigger, okay? I, I'm mature. So my spirit is perfectly mature. My body is mature. So where do I need to grow up? In the soul. The soul realm is where we need to mature. And different Bible writers in the New Covenant have different ways of talking about this. Okay, so Paul in Romans 12 and verse 2 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay, your life will be transformed as you renew your mind, as you change the way you think. That's called growing up. Paul even calls it growing up to the Corinthians. When I was a child, I used to think in childish ways. But when I became a man, I put away childish thoughts. Okay, I didn't think the same. How many of you know you don't think the same about things as you did when you were seven years old? Okay, you've matured. And we need to mature as Christians by putting away immature, petty, silly thoughts and thinking big, godly thoughts. John calls this process soul prosperity. Beloved, I talked about this on Wednesday night, didn't I? I pray above all else that you would prosper and be in health even as, even as your soul prospers. Okay, so that means your soul, your thinking, your, your, your soul grows up, it matures, it succeeds. And James calls it soul salvation in James 1.21. Your spirit's already saved, it's just like Jesus. But your soul is growing in salvation as you receive the word with meekness. Every one of us needs to mature and grow up. But before we grow up, excuse me a second. Before we grow up, we have to learn to locate ourselves. Okay, in what areas of your life are you immature? In what areas of your life are you mature? In what areas of your life do you need to work on? In what areas of your life do you need to grow up a bit? And every one of us has areas where we need to grow up a bit. And the reason we're doing this first is because I want all of us by the end of this course to be able to be mature and be able to identify and grow and um, but also be able to help encourage others grow and we'll talk about how to lead others to a place of maturity and how to create a culture that respects and honors maturity a lot of churches okay i'm giving you the game where i'm heading here okay in a few weeks time a lot of churches have what i call a regressive culture they tend towards the most immature person that the loudest whiniest most immature person in the church gets all the attention so therefore the whole church knows on a subconscious level Everyone in the church knows, that whole community knows, if you want attention in this place, if you want pastor's attention, if you want everyone to, you want to be the center of attention in the room, be the most immature person in the room. I got a problem, I got a big problem, I got a bigger problem, I got a bigger problem. And you have this race to see who's the most immature and the most petty because people love attention. 
But what we need to do is build into our churches a progressive culture that values and celebrates people who are mature. And then people go, oh, I need to mature. And that's where I get the attention. And that, that, that's very important. But we can't do this unless we mature ourselves. Okay? We have to find out how mature we are. And one of the things that happens a lot, a lot, a lot, is a lot of people come to Tree of Life thinking they're a lot more mature than what they actually are. They think their mind is a lot more in line with God's word than what it actually is. And if you think you're up here and you're actually down here, it's very difficult to grow. Okay. If you think that's it, if you think that's how, you know, you can't go much further. I'm telling you, there's a lot further for all of us. There's a, we could all be a lot more like Jesus in a lot more areas. Okay. So let's open the Bible, Ephesians chapter four. Um, so good morning to everyone who's saying good morning on the chat. Good morning, Maureen, Teresa, Carl, uh, Gary, Sadia, Bill and Susanna, Maria. Good to have you all with us. And uh, I know there's a lot of people listening who haven't said hello, but hello to all of you. Um, but turn to Ephesians chapter four, okay? And I want to help you today locate yourself just to know, you know, and, and here's the thing, you can be mature in one area and have really adult, mature, Christian word-like thoughts, and then in another area, you can be quite immature and have really petty thoughts and really ungodly thoughts and really selfish thoughts. So we need to work out how to grow because, you know, have you ever seen a kid um, try to tell off another kid? Try, you know, have you ever seen a little kid trying to tell off another kid, not like a grown-up to the other kid? It's not a nice sight. And uh, we see that in churches sometimes. People try and correct people and stuff, they're not mature. And it's not pleasant for anyone. So Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 11. Okay, you all know verse 11. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some pastors, and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Don't miss out the evangelists. Equipping the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in the faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature. Mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. So our standard for maturity is not my last church. It's not that really nice person down the road. The standard of maturity is the full and complete standard of Christ. Um, mature, uh, the King James doesn't use the word mature. The King James uses the word perfect um, because the, the Greek word is teleos, teleos, and it means to be complete. It means to be perfect. It means to need nothing more to be complete. It means it doesn't need to grow anymore. That's why we have the word mature. It means grown up. And when you use it of a human, it means an adult, a grown up, a mature person. It means the growth cycle's over. Okay? And that's where we need to be. We need to be Christians who in most of the areas of our life, especially if we're going to lead others and influence others, our, our growth cycle's over. Okay? That, that, well, when you offend me, I just forgive you. I'm not working on that every week. I'm not coming home from church every week as a leader and going, I've got to forgive that person. I've got to, forgive, I've got to deal with this. I've got to get my heart right on this and not speak to somebody for a month because they didn't do what I did about here. And they didn't do that. No, no, no. We need to grow up. Then, verse 14, read verse 14 very carefully. This is so important. Then we will no longer be immature children. The Greek there is nepios. So what we need to be is teleos mature fully grown doesn't necessarily mean you have to be absolutely shimmeringly golden perfect but you handle things like a mature grown-up but the 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 what we need not to be is children nepios now that's not the normal word for child if you know a little bit of greek you know nepios not the normal word um it means childish it means immature unskilled untaught it literally nepios literally means unable to speak properly okay that's what the the, the word here is they can't speak properly Okay, so the, the, the Greek had this word nepios, and it was used for children who weren't old enough to speak, or they're nepios, they're, they're unskilled in talking, or they can't talk yet. And then that became, by extension, like so many words do, it became an insult to people. Stop being such a nepios. You know, no, 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 oh, you're just nepios, just blah, 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 and you're, not, you're not speaking properly. Okay, and it became an insult. I mean, you've all heard that, haven't you, little kids? Um, one of our children, I can't remember which one, they couldn't say Joel's name properly. You know, we've got a boy called Joel and one of the kids been a little, whoa, 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 you know, which is, is, is beautiful when it's a little kid going, whoa, whoa, you know, but if you have an adult's talking like that, you think what's wrong with them. Okay. You're a bit nepios there. You need to grow up. You need to learn to talk properly. And uh, as Christians, we hear adults say, you know, oh, God's put me on this shelf and I don't think God loves me. And I don't know why God's put this on me. Okay. Well, there's areas you need to grow up in. 
okay there's areas where you need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind there's areas where your soul needs to prosper so you can prosper and be in health there's areas where you need to be transformed by the saving of your soul by receiving meekly the word of the lord and then if we're not immature and we grow up what are the benefits of that we won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching okay now let's just pause and i want to help you locate yourself okay i want to help you locate yourself i love you i'm doing this because i love you people who are running around with winds of new teaching all the time that is a massive sign of immaturity okay paul says when we grow up we won't be immature children anymore we won't be childish anymore and one of the things that will happen immediately is we won't be tossed and blown about by all these new teachings that word tossed and blown about in the greek is cladonizomai it means thrown up and around all agitated all stirred up all up and down all the time okay and that's one of the things that is the hallmark of an immature Christian. And uh, it's fine to be immature when you're born. Yes? Babies, okay, for babies to be mature. So if you've only been a Christian for a few months, or a year or two, you know, it happens. It happens with new Christians is they hear a teaching and they just go with it. And then they hear another teaching and they go with it. And they're always looking for the new thing. They're blown to and about by the wind animos that word there for wind animos that's not a nice little summer breeze it's a violent wind it's the kind of wind they had embarking in ilford last night it's the kind of wind that moves you it knocks down trees it, it's, it's the word used for wind when the, the the foolish man built his house on the sand it's the kind of wind that knocks your house over it's the wind of the storm that amazed peter and he couldn't walk on the water because the wind was strong it means a violent strong wind and immature people are carried around by wind. Immature people don't choose their own direction in life. And sadly, so sadly, there's a lot of immaturity in the church. People are running after this, and then the next day they're running after this, and they're trying all sorts of different ways to do things rather than the word. And I, I spot those people in my life because they email me, ben, have you read this book? And, oh, have you read this book? And have you seen this preacher? And have you seen that preacher? And, and really none of that moves me, but it moves them because they're immature. That wind of, oh, that's popular in the body of Christ now, oh, and suddenly it's not popular. And I realized this well before I started Tree of Life. Uh, when I was living in Wales, and um, there was this thing that was being called a revival in Florida. And it was all over the Christian media, certain Christian TV stations stopped all their programs and started putting this out. And um, this preacher was the wind of a new teaching. It was a wind, it was a violent wind, it was everywhere. And uh, I saw pastors change everything they're doing and go over there and come back and just copy his meetings exactly. No, caveat. I'm not opposed to learning new things. You know that about me. I'm not against learning new things. I'm not against visiting places where it's obvious God is moving and learning from those who've gone before. You know, I do that a lot. Okay. But what I saw was marked with immaturity. People were leaving what God had called them to do because this was new and it was fancy and it was a thing and the thing blew up churches fell apart i've just found out this week from talking to somebody another church has closed down because of that thing churches fell apart i know a church in london it started almost the same week we started tree of life and it exploded with growth we were struggling to get 20 people together and these guys were running 250 and um, it had a name attached to it. I didn't add my name and Tree of Life's name, and that wasn't worth that much. It was not, not worth much now, but it wasn't worth anything then. Um, no one had ever heard of Tree of Life in 2010. And, but, but this other church, it exploded, had all this growth, but they just went with every wind of doctrine. They canceled preaching. And they, they had these evenings where you just screamed at God all night. And then they did hours and hours of worship with no word. I mean, that, that's like pouring all the water on the soil and not putting any seed in. It's not, never going to work. You, you've just left the Bible behind for all these novel things. And, you know, that, that church just fell apart. Listen to me. Write this down if you're taking notes. The number one sign of immaturity is chasing the wind. You're always chasing something. You're, always, you're never planted. I see so many of these people. They're running after this. They're running after that. And they're never planted into anything. So you need to give yourself a checkup from the neck up. That's what today's session is about. Locate yourself. Am I planted? Am I grounded in truth? Am I sniffing ready to run, run to something? 
you know, one of the things that happens when I do my, my weekly Q and A's, it happens quite a bit, is people go, well, I've been reading this book and it says this about the scripture. And the book's really bizarre and the author's really weird and the, 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 what they say about the scripture is just crazy. And I think, why are you reading that book? There are so many good books from people who are established in the word. Well, they'll tell you why they're reading that book. I'll tell you why now, because they're immature. They're looking for something wonderful. You know, what's the hallmark of an immature child? Every one of you who's been a parent knows one of the dangers of having a child is they put everything in their mouth. Oh, what's that? What's that? What's that? They've got no discernment. And immature people, especially, you know, and if it's new Christians, you're allowed to be immature because you're new. But, you know, if you've been doing this for a few years, you know, they're just reading everything. Look, I'm looking for something exciting. You know, leave the excitement to your nonfiction books and read the Bible. Read the Word. Line everything up against the Word of God. Otherwise, where are we going to end up? Where are we going to be? And then the second thing it says here is this. We won't be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound true. Okay, so the first sign of immaturity is getting blown about by the wind, always chasing something. The second sign of immaturity is a naivety that always falls for lies. Okay, now the, the, the King James has this beautiful phrase, your cunning, cunning craftiness, cunning craftiness. It's one word in the Greek, panergia, and it means a false wisdom, the ability to trick and deceive people. I really find it amazing what people fall for, what scams and uh, tricks people fall for. We had a lady come to our church and she approached me and she wanted to borrow some money from the church, thousands of pounds. And she'd only been to the church a few weeks. She wasn't there consistently. She wasn't there regularly. She didn't serve. She wasn't part of a small group. She'd just been, um, I reckon she'd been there just enough to probably be going to three or four other churches as well. And I assumed instantly that she's just asking all these different churches for money because I've lost my job. And she's telling me this whole sob story. And at the time, she's wearing nice clothes, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And it just didn't look like a sob story. And so I'm not about to do that. And, um, you know, we have a lot of people come to our church and tell us their sob story and want to borrow money. And then the money never gets paid back. And, you know, most churches will forgive that because we're forgiving. And most people rely on that kind of stuff. And so um, it turned out somebody came to me from the church and said she's borrowed some money off me. And it turned out she'd borrowed over £10,000 from different people in our church. And, I, and I, I really struggled. I thought, how could people fall for that? How could people be so immature to fall for that and actually lend her money? And it's because we want to be nice and we want to be kind and we want to love people. But we have to be very, very careful that we don't fall for things. Because if, you if, you, if you're immature and you want to get rich quick and you don't want to pay the price, you'll fall for a get rich quick scheme. We've had people come to me with all sorts of schemes, pyramid schemes. But you're the pastor. You'll be at the top of the scheme. And everyone will buy your insurance policy. And everyone will buy your fiber. And, everyone will buy, I'm out, I'm out, and I've had to shut it down from people who come to church. Now, you can be mature in one area and immature in others. You can be not chasing the wind, but still falling for the schemes and tricks. We need to grow up. We all need to grow up. And as we grow up, we don't fall for lies because we just become more mature. Okay? And it's amazing how many of us fall for things because we're just really mature. We think, oh, that sounds awesome. And it's not awesome. And we need to grow up and mature. You see, when you mature, you're grounded in the words. So someone says, oh, let, let, let's just do this. This is going to be, no, you think, no, that's not biblical. But that, that, that's not how they did things in the Bible. And you just stand against it. Well, everyone else is doing it. Yeah, I don't care what everyone else is doing. I care about the word of God and I care about living for the word. That's called growing up. Instead, verse 15, we speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who's the head of his body, the church. So here is our first sign of being mature. Mature people speak truth in love. And one of the biggest signs that the community that you are part of, the church that you're in, is mature, is do they speak the truth in love? Okay, so we speak the truth in love. And you see, some people it's very difficult to speak the truth to because they're so immature. Because if you tell them the truth, they're going to explode. But if you have mature people and you have a community of mature people, you can speak the truth and people understand the truth and they love the truth. And yeah, they might not appreciate it at first, but they deal with it and process it because it's the truth. And they speak the truth in love, not to brag about what we know. I'm going to tell you the truth to show you how much truth I know. I meet people like that quite a bit. You know, day one, 
day one of being in Tree of Life. Here, have a copy of my book, Pastor. I wrote a book. You know, I wrote a book. Here's my book. And, and, and Pastor, I want to tell you about my revelation on this. I want to tell you about my... Uh, it's day one. I, I didn't come to your church. You came to my church. Uh, you know, stop being so immature. Speak the truth in love. You know, try to, stop trying to speak the truth to promote a ministry or self-promote, but speak the truth to help others. Last Sunday in Dagenham, Amanda got up and had a word. Maria got up and had a word. Jermaine received the offering. And it was beautiful because no one was building themselves up. They were just obsessed with building the people up. And it showed. I can tell the maturity of the people I'm preaching to by this. How easily can I preach what's true? Because there's many groups of Christians who just don't want to hear the truth. Doesn't matter how loving I am, they just don't want to know the truth. They don't want to know what the Bible says about a certain issue. It doesn't bother them. They'd rather stay in their tradition. They'd rather blame other people for where they are. We can't possibly be, I have what I say. Don't tell me that for the last 50 years my life's been like this because of what I say. No, it's just God put me on the shelf and God doesn't like me. No, it's you. You know, how well can you receive the truth? He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. That's verse 16. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. So the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. That's the goal of maturity. As we grow up, the body fits together. We move forward in community. There is no maturity without community. If you think you can be the lone ranger Christian, you are deluded. Again, it is amazing how in so many places, the church has redefined maturity. It's not how old you are. I know people in their 70s, 80s who are immature. That their mind is not renewed. They don't think Bible thoughts. It's not how placid and weak you are. It's not about temperament. It's not based on knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. It doesn't build up. It's not about going to Bible college. I know so far too many Bible college graduates who are really immature. All the markers of their life are immaturity, and they have no markers of maturity. It doesn't mature you going to Bible college unless you work with the process. So this is so important. It's not about those things. Maturity is expressed in community, and maturity is revealed in community. You might think you're really mature until you go to church. And you meet other people, and some of them are a bit difficult, and some need a bit of extra grace, and some of them are young, and some of them are new Christians, and some of them are sitting in your chair. And or you, then, then you come away and you go, oh, goodness me, I've got some work to do. I've got something I need to know. So I'm trying to help you locate yourself. I want to help you locate yourself. I'm going to give you a little scale right now. Baby, child, adult. Baby, child, adult. Okay? Does the Bible talk about being babies? Yes. First Peter 2 and verse 2. As newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow so if you're a baby what's your number one thing to do get fed get the milk get the word in you that's the most powerful verse if you're immature in any area the path to maturity is the word of god the word of god is soul food eat your soul food drink your milk eat your greens and get big and strong in your soul but this is talking about Christians, isn't it? First Peter 2, verse 2, and Peter's calling them babies. Okay, you have to think this through, okay? No one listening right now was ever born an adult. Naturally, I'm talking about naturally now. Naturally and physically, you were born a baby, and somebody had to feed you. If nobody fed you, you would die. You would still stay baby. But you, someone fed you, and you grew up, and now you can feed yourself. You were born a natural baby and had to grow up. Now, when you became a Christian, you got born again. You're now, in your soul, a baby. Your spirit's perfect. Your spirit's just like Jesus, but your soul is a baby. You are a baby at being a Christian. You've got no experience. You've never, ever done it all the stuff as a Christian you need to do to have a, a, a prosperous, living soul. And so you ha need food to grow. Now, one of the reasons why I felt it was important to put this in the leadership course is this. When you have a church and people are becoming Christians in that church and people are getting saved in that church, now they're babies. Okay? So you might be listening to this going, I'm not a baby. Okay, great. You're not a baby. That's great. But your church should have some babies. There should be people getting born again. There should be new Christians coming to your church. And they can't feed themselves. We have to feed them. Babies can't walk anywhere. We have to pick them up and carry them. They can't change their own messes. 
we have to help them. That's one of the greatest milestones of growing up, isn't it? Is when you can take care of your own messes and clean yourself up and wipe yourself and get on with it. We all make messes, hello. But an adult can deal with it themselves. They don't need anyone else to wipe or clean or wash. Part of being mature is how you treat the immature. And I want a culture in Tree of Life where someone comes to Tree of Life and gets saved, we're going to really help them grow. We're going to get their names and addresses. We don't expect a baby to come to church on their own. We don't expect a baby to get up and walk to church. We go and visit them. We take them out for lunch. We feed them. We help them grow. So let's talk about baby Christians. Let's talk about the markers of a baby Christian. Thanks, Teresa. That's encouraging. Um, markers of a baby Christian, okay? So number one, number one thing about a baby, think about a natural baby, okay? That'll help you understand a newborn Christian. They're innocent, aren't they? I mean, I love it when someone brings a baby to church. I do, I love it. They're so sweet. They're so innocent. And they don't have a past. Did you know that when you're born again, you don't have a past? You understand what I'm saying? And, you know, you're a new creation. We have to make sure that new Christians grasp this. Everything that happened before, it's over. You're new now. You're newborn. You've got that new innocence. And I love that when someone first becomes a Christian, they've got that new glow, that radiant baby glow. And don't outgrow that. Okay? Don't outgrow that. Keep that. And I love it when a baby Christian, you know, babies love to get fed. And if they don't get fed, they're like, I don't get fed. You know, I love it when you get a baby Christian. Just feed me the word. Give me the word. They just want to grow. It is much easier for a newborn Christian who's a baby to grow. They say, I want the word. I want the word. Then you get some Christian who thinks they're all grown up because they've been doing it for 30 years and they think they know everything. And, oh, yes. You know, and the, the kind of person who would actually correct God. Do you know what I mean? They tell God, God, I think you've got that wrong. Like, oh. You know, the, the, those people are the biggest babies in the whole church because they're not correctable. You know, we had somebody come to our church and they said, I'm the world expert on this, this book of the Bible. Are you really? And it was just that's the first thing they told me the first time they met me. No, you see, I mean, this person was not living a mature life, they weren't living a godly life, they weren't living a fruitful life. He's got to come back to our lifestyle. So, number one, babies are innocent, I love that about them. Okay, number two, they're ignorant. Remember, we said they, they fall for tricks, they chase every wind. You know, all of my children are grown up now, really. Lydia's kind of mostly grown up, but I remember when they were babies. And again, I said this earlier, the biggest problem is they just put everything in their mouth, you know? Yeah, they put the food in the mouth, that's great, but they'll stick a nail in their mouth, they'll stick a spider in their mouth, you know, it just goes in there. They don't know what's good for them, and they don't know what's bad for them. They don't know what's safe, they don't know what's unsafe. And it is a tragedy. Some babies have died because they drank something or ate something that as an adult, you would know, to don't put that in your mouth. Immaturity can be dangerous. Babies need looking after. You can't just leave them alone. We as Christians, all of us, whatever stage of maturity we're at, we need to be very careful what we feed on, what information. I have seen so many Christians lose their way so quickly because of bad, poor information, false doctrine, strange ideas. They go off into the strange and they stop being fruitful. And they always have the same response when you speak to them about it and when you try and talk to them and try and bring them back to the past. God's doing a new thing. No, he's not. God's doing the same thing. God's doing the word. God's doing the spirit. God's doing love one another. God's not doing a new thing. He's doing the same thing. There might be new emphasis at certain times and places, but if you leave the fundamental truths of God's word, you're going off into the stupid. And I meet so many Christians who will put anything in their mouth, anything in their mind, apart from the word of God. And the tragedy is they then start to lead people into the same stupidity. You know, I've gone around some of your houses, and I love you all, and I've seen some real poisonous stuff on your bookshelves. It'll kill you if you read it. Sometimes I try and help someone. and go, you know, that book you've got on your bookshelf there, that, that, that's not going to lead you to maturity. It's not going to bless you when you read it. There's Bible verses in there. Of course there is. I mean, if I'm going to poison a rat, I put the poison on a bit of rat food. I put it on the meat. I don't just give them the poison because they won't take it. Sailor. Babies are innocent. Babies are ignorant. And babies are irritable. Yes, babies get narky really easily. They get upset easily. They cry at the drop of a hat. That's another hallmark of immaturity. You know, when you put a baby to bed, they've got to have the light on, but not too bright. And they've got to be warm, but not too warm. And they've got to have the toy. And they've got to have this. And they've got to have that. Why? Because they're babies. 
We need to get beyond that irritability of babies. Psalm 131 and verse 2 says, My soul is even that of a weaned child. In other words, I grew up. I stopped being a baby. Abraham had a feast the day Isaac was weaned because he celebrated his maturity. We need to celebrate when we get Christians off the ball. And you know, but what happens is we get a baby in the church and there's no bottle for that baby. There's no bed for that baby. There's no one to love that baby and help that newborn Christian because all the cots and all the, the bottles are being used by the elders and deacons in most churches. I know far too many Christians who are supposed to be mature, supposed to be grown up, but you have to run after them and you have to chase them. I'm talking about people, people have been Christians for decades and they'll deliberately skip church Sunday to get your attention as a pastor on Monday. Babies. What do babies need to do? If you know there's an area of your life where you're a baby, okay, you go, my goodness me, I'm immature there. I'm, if, you, if you get me in that area, I'm really irritable. I don't understand this area. I'm ignorant. I've, I've, I've gone off after the wind. I've fallen for things I shouldn't have fallen for. Then what do you need to do? Desire the milk of the word. Why? Because the milk of the word helps you grow. I preached in a church once. And at the end of it, the pastor said to me, he said, you give my people too much. You're feeding them too much. They can only take a little bit. I only give them milk. I said, you don't give your people milk. If you give your people milk, they'll grow. These people are not growing. If you feed someone, they'll grow. And we need to all become feeders. But at the moment, and, and, and for the purpose of this session, where do you need to feed yourself? Where do you need to get in the Word? If you're struggling with joy, if you're not a naturally joyous person, okay, well, the Bible's got a lot to say about joy. Go and do some Bible studies on joy. Get the Word of God about joy into you. If you're struggling with offenses and bitterness, okay, well, what does the Bible say about that? Do a Bible study, get the word inside you, whatever area you're immature, what does the word say? And feed on the word, and therefore you will grow. Amen. And keep coming to church, keep being in the meetings, because we have a great team of pastors who will keep feeding you stuff that will help you grow. So the next stage, start to grow, I'm next, become a child. Babies grow up and become children. We can be children when it comes to the maturity of our soul. Not babies, not crying all the time, not wetting ourselves all the time. We've got a little bit of maturity, but not that much, okay? I'm talking about your average 10 to 15-year-old here. Ephesians 4 says, do not be children anymore. So if the Bible says, don't be children anymore, we can be children. I'm talking about in the soul realm. I'm talking about the way we think, okay? And so babies are innocent ignorant and irritable children are uh, start with instable 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 instability instability still like that instability okay have you noticed when your kids are that age they're like yo-yos they're off they're hot they're cold you know you ask your teenage son can you mow the lawn please can you cut the grass and they take that lawnmower and zoom now 100 miles an hour and you think my goodness me he's gonna mow this whole lawn he's gonna cut the grass in 20 minutes and then you go outside 10 minutes later to see how he's doing, and there's an abandoned lawnmower. There's a one line of, you know, cut grass. Everything else is undone. You're like, where's the child? And you can suddenly hear, you know, and suddenly they're on the Xbox, the PlayStation, and they're having a drink. Oh, I just thought I'd take a little break. They're, in, they're, they're unreliable. And ch children Christian are unreliable. You can't rely on them. They'll zoom 100 miles an hour. I'm with this church. This church the best church I've ever been to. And then you don't see them for six months. I'll go, go, go to this church. Okay, it's going to help me as a pastor. If you could just tell me why you've left the church, why you're going to go to this church down the road, because I want to be a better pastor. Oh, I just don't feel it, man. You just don't feel it. You're a child. You're behaving like a child. You're acting like a child. Okay, children have instability about them. You know, people turn up. This will, this will happen this year. I guarantee this will happen this year. People will turn up Friday night at Heal the Nations. They won't have been there Wednesday. They won't have been there all the day sessions Thursday. They weren't there Thursday night. They weren't there Friday. They come Friday night. Why? Because they couldn't be bothered to get a couple of days off work. Because they didn't like the idea of a four-day conference. It's too much for them. So they, they turned it into a little two-day conference for themselves. And so they go Friday night, Saturday morning, they're there. They'll probably want to stay all the Saturday. Two sessions is just too much for them. And then they'll complain, oh, this conference isn't long enough. It finishes too soon. No, you finished it too soon. You could have had a whole week of this. Children are unreliable. They have this instability about them. So it's instability. The other thing about children is, is they're inquisitive. Okay, they want to know everything that's going on. This is actually a childish quality. You know, if I got a parcel and put it in the table in the dining room, I guarantee you my kids were that sort of age, 10, 11, 12, 13, what's that? What's in the pie? What's in the box? What's in the box? What's going on? They want to know everything that's going on. 
I get very concerned when there's people like that. I get calls sometimes. I mean, if it's one of my pastors calling, it's different because they should know what's going on. But I get calls from people. Well, can you explain what's going on with this person's life, please? And I want to say, don't be so flipping nosy. It's none of your business. Or can you tell me what you're doing in this church here? What you mean the church you don't go to and you're not part of? What, 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 why does that matter to you? What's happening there? One of the big signs to me as a pastor of immaturity is when I see someone who's always poking their nose in where it doesn't belong. They always want to know everyone else's business. The Bible's very clear. It's in First Thessalonians. Mind your own business. Someone came to me a couple of years back and said, I would like you to give me a written outline of what you spend your salary on. I said, you first. You go first. And he told me, it's none of your business what I spend my money on. Well, join the club. It's none of your business what I spend my income on. See, this is a real problem with some people. And they poke their nose in and it destroys community. Psalm 131, a great psalm about leadership. David says in that psalm, he says, I don't concern my th myself with things too lofty for me. Okay, the modern phrase would be, that's above my pay grade. That's none of my business. And one of the signs of maturity is to say, that's not my circus. That's not my donkey. That's not my monkey. That's not my situation. It doesn't bother me. I've got enough to get on with in my own life. And that's the problem, you see, is most of those people are poking their nose in everyone else's business and not minding their own business. They're not looking after their own stuff. They're not doing too well themselves. And that's why they're looking for the drama in other people's lives. They're inquisitive. And that, that, you know, that, 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 that's a wrong inquisitiveness. So they've got instability, they're inquisitive, and they're incessant. Do you remember that? You know, until I had four kids, I never understood that scene in um, Star Wars where Luke just keeps asking Yoda questions and Yoda thinks, you know what, stuff, I'm just going to die. <sighs> you know, it just goes off and becomes one with the force. You know, kids just never shut up. And I, I don't mean don't quit in the good sense of, you know, that motivational don't quit, never give up. I, you know, I mean, when someone gets a bee in their bonnet about something and they just can't drop it. They keep going on and on and on about things that are just not worth anything. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 3 says a fool's voice, a fool's voice is known by a lot of words. A fool's voice is known by a lot of words. Children, childish people just don't stop talking about stuff. Blah, 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 blah. And so what happens if you never shut up? Well, number one, you're going to end up in gossip. You're going to end up in gossip. Okay? You're going to end up talking about the faults and failures of someone who's not there. That's called immaturity. Uh, even if you wrap it up in a nice little prayer request, oh, can we all please pray for my husband, please, because he's this and he's that and he's that, and you've turned the whole church against him before he even turns up. Gossip, vain speaking, okay? That's another um, biblical phrase, vain speaking. It means to bang on about yourself. We've got to be careful that we talk about the Lord, not just what we do. We have to be careful during worship too. There's a lot of songs out there about what we feel. I'm dust. I'm not against declarations. I'm not against singing about, you know, I know the walls are going to come down. No, I'm not against it. But we have to be careful that at some point we're ministering to the Lord. We're not just ministering to the, the, the selfish carnal among us, but we're ministering to the Lord. We're worshiping Jesus. We're exalting Jesus. We're singing about Jesus. We're talking about Jesus. And then the, 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 the next thing is coming. If you talk all the time, you're going to end up in silly talk. Okay. Now I'm all for funny. I like a joke or two. Okay. I like sharing jokes with people. Okay. But some people can't stop joking to deal with a serious issue. And there are times when it's important to be serious. Uh, and there's one church I go and speak at. It's not true of life church, but there's a guy there. He's always the guy at the door when I come. He's always the guy at the door. And he does a great job greeting, but he always tells me a joke every time I come. And he's got all these jokes. And then one time he came to me and he said, I wish I could memorize the scripture the way you do. What's your quote? I thought, I said, you've got great memory. He said, I don't. I said, you do. I said, you got all those jokes all the time. Maybe you just need to lift the conversation every now and again and not just think about joking all the time. But good talking now, listen, if you start saying the right words, make the right declaration, good talking actually help you grow. And it's one of the, one of the saddest things I have is I travel to a lot of churches and I go to a lot of nations and a lot of pastors want to talk about the football and they want to talk about the economy and they want to talk about other careers for some reason. They want to tell me all about their car and 
It's okay to watch the football and it's fine to have a new car and a great car. It's great to have a nice house. But if you don't want to talk about God, I, 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 I don't know how to handle that because I like talking about God. So we have the baby phase, the child phase, then we have the mature phase, the complete phase. And we're going to say a lot about that in the next few weeks. But I want to talk about specifically right now about how to locate yourself. You know, where am I mature? Okay. And what are my eyes for maturity? Number one, immune to praise and criticism. This is one of the ways I check myself and I check others. Are you immune to praise and criticism? As a pastor, it's one of the easiest ways for me to see if someone is mature or immature. They're dead to being criticized and they're dead to being praised. There is a level of maturity we need to reach where the opinions of others are not what move us. That we're not easily puffed up by praise. We're not easily touchy by criticism. We're not resentful of correction. We don't fly off the handle if someone says, you could have done that a different way. Immature Christians, one of the hallmarks of immature Christians is they don't handle criticism or correction well. If they're criticized, even if they just feel criticized, they get upset, they get uneasy, they jump into a pit of self-pity, oh, you hate me, oh, no, 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 we love you. That's why we're helping you, you know? And it's very difficult when you put someone in a position of leadership and then you can't correct how they do their job of leadership, then they're so touchy, then you have a real problem. But then the same people, if they feel noticed, if they feel praised, they get all lifted up. Now they're all self-important. Okay. I could say it like this. Baby Christians are very self-aware. They're very aware of what everyone else thinks of them. They're caught in that back and forth. Why are they going after every wind of doctrine? Because they want to be where all the cool kids are. They want to be popular. You know, you need to reach an age of maturity where it doesn't really matter who sits at the table with you. You sit at the right table because it's the right table. We need to be like Paul. Paul said this. It is a small thing that I'm judged of you. In other words, it's nice. It's nice when you say, good job, Ben. I appreciate that message. That message really spoke to me. It's nice, but it's a small thing. The big thing in my life is, what does the Lord think? I'm not dancing for the praise of men. I'm not dancing for the Christian men. I'm dancing for the Lord. And uh, it's a small thing. The opinion of others was a small thing to Paul. That is one of the hallmarks of maturity. Is you are dead to praise. It doesn't move you. It doesn't stop you doing what God calls you to do. And you're dead to criticism. It doesn't move you. One of the things the Lord has been telling me about is that as we start to grow tree of life, there's going to be more criticism coming my way. I'm like, more? I already feel like I'm one of the most criticized people in the nation. <laughs> well, apart from Matt Hancock this week. Um, but, you know, I just feel, feel there's a lot that coming, a lot more. I said, okay, what do I need to do? You need to be more mature. You need to spend more time with me. You need to rest in me. Because then it won't matter. It is a small thing that I'm judged by you, whether it's a good judgment or a bad judgment. I hope that makes sense. I wasn't communicating that well. Again, that's not about, I want you to encourage me or praise me. I really want you to be free. I'm not really thinking about myself today. I'm thinking about you. And that's a good preacher. They're not thinking about what they think of me, what do they like me. I'm thinking about how can I best help you? How can I best feed you? How can I best get through to you? And so I'm, I'm just hoping what I'm saying is understandable to you. And you realize that that's a great marker of maturity. That really helps me as a leader know whether I'm being mature. It helps me assess myself. And as a leader of leaders, it helps me assess my leaders to make sure they're in a good place. If I start to see one of my leaders and they start to be moved by praise and they start to be moved by, you know, the spotlight and they start, or, or, or the other way, they're moved by criticism. Oh, I can't do that. I can't take an offering, Ben, this Sunday. I know you want to take the big offering on Sunday. But there's a couple of people in my church who aren't going to be too happy if I get up and I talk about money. So I'm not going to do that this time. Whoa, 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 whoa. That, that a couple of people being unhappy about you taking an offering is not why we don't, you know, that, that's not why we do things. It is a small thing to be judged of you. Okay, the second one, the second one, this is such an important sign of maturity. I might even do a whole week on this. It's so important. Is that one of the hallmarks of Christian maturity is you ignore sense knowledge. Okay, you ignore sense knowledge. Moses, it's in Hebrews 11, we're talking about by faith, he lived by faith, he refused the world and the riches of the world. The world was saying, Moses, you could be rich, you could do this, you could have this. He said, I'm not moved by the world. We need to do the same. We need to ignore any knowledge that comes from our senses. It should never move us. When I see someone who can ignore the knowledge of their senses, they're really mature. You know, if you see someone in a wheelchair, but you can still believe for their healing, that's mature in that area. You know, if someone scratches your car, that's sense knowledge. And you don't get upset and you're like, well, God loves you. I love you then you're mature in that area. If you can turn your back on Egypt and what Egypt offers you, you're mature. 
one of the highlights of a mature person is they're moved by the word and the spirit a lot more than they're ever moved by this world. You know, and I've talked about this before, but people have left Tree of Life because they've gone to a town, a town that has no good church because it gave them a £5,000 pay rise or something like that. Because money moves them, God doesn't. Because they've never been mature. They've never learned how to ignore their senses and live by faith. Now, God wants you to prosper. I made that very clear on Wednesday. If you haven't heard Wednesday's message, you should listen to Wednesday's message on prosperity. I made it very clear. But God never wants money to be your driver, to be your leader. If I, if she, if she, and again, there's a double standard with most people. There is, there's a double standard. If I got up tomorrow, Sunday morning, stood in front of Tree of Life Dagnum and said, guys, I'm leaving Tree of Life. I'm leaving Dagnum. I'm leaving the Tree of Life family. I'm going to America. I've got a new job. They've offered me a church twice as big as you, a salary three times as big, and a car four times as big, and a house five times as big. Oh, it's hard living by faith. And uh, it's hard trying to do something in London. But look at this big offer, and I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go for it. I think it's the will of God. I'm going for it. People would go, it's all about the money with you, isn't it? It's all about the money. It's all about money. You're driven by money. You're doing it for money. That's what they would say. But those same people would think nothing, getting a bad job, leaving a church that loves them and cares for them and helps them and move to a town where the only church there helps them backslide and start living for the devil. But it's all about the money. It's a double standard. We, all of us, not just the ministers, all of us need to be putting the things of God first. Seek first the kingdom of God, and then these things will be added to you. Some people are going to actually move. People are trying to move out of Dagenham and move out of the East End of London. But people are actually going to move into the East End of London to be part of Tree of Life because Tree of Life is there. And you're going to find, because they put the kingdom first, they're going to have houses and property and property portfolios in London. They're going to get the best jobs. Some are going to get six-figure jobs they never dreamed of getting in other parts of the country. But they're going to get them and they're going to prosper because they put the kingdom of God first. And I'm excited about it. That's called maturity. We have to be mature. We have to put the kingdom of God first. Ignore sense knowledge and live by faith. And again, that's how I mark myself. Am I being moved by my senses in that area? Am I being moved by, am I logging on frantically to see what the bank statement is before I make a decision? Do, you know, if I've got several rooms, um, several conference centers where I could have healing nations and God says this one, but I'm still looking at the budget and I'm still looking at how much money or God says go on TV in this station and I'm asking how much it is and I'm asking this and I'm asking that, I'm being moved by senses. And that's why a lot of pastors, their churches aren't growing and what they're doing is not growing because they're moved by what they sense. And that's why a lot of people are stuck in life because they never mature to the place where they can esteem earthly things lightly. That is a hallmark of maturity. And again, that's how I look at my leaders as well. It's one of the ways I make sure, you know, are they holding on tightly to earthly things? And then finally, the third hallmark of maturity is identify the work of God. You have three eyes for babies, three eyes for children. Here's your third eye for mature maturity. Immune to praise and criticism, ignore sense knowledge, and identify the work of God. In other words, they can tell when God's doing something. They can see when God's there. They move at the same speed as God. They don't run ahead of God. Well, I've got to get into this ministry now. I've got to do this now, Ben. Ben, Ben, Ben. I've got to go and partner church right now. I've got to go to Bible college right now. I've got to do it right now, right now, right now, right now. Okay, is, is that the speed God's moving or does God want to work in your character for a little bit first? Does God want to build a little bit deeper in your heart before he starts building more on you? No, it's an open door. It's an open door. I've got the open door. Okay, well, that, that's moving ahead of God. Other people lag behind God. You know, come on now, you're supposed to be ministering now. You're supposed to have started that church by now. Well, yeah, well, 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 once I've sorted out my pension and once I've sorted out this and once I've sorted out that, you know, it's, 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 it's a funny thing. And I've spoke to Bible college students all over the world. I've been a Bible college student in several Bible colleges myself. People say I hate Bible colleges. Not one of them's ever been to Bible college as much as I have. Um, but you will find in every Bible college class anywhere in the world, you will find several people who are retired. Now, if that's when God calls you after you've retired, or that's when you find out about the kingdom, that's when you get saved, that's fine. But a lot of these people, you'll find God called them to go when they were 30, and they didn't. They didn't go when they were 35, they didn't go when they were 40, because everything else came first, because they didn't realize the speed God was moving, and they lagged behind. And now they're 70 years old, and they're old, and they're not as strong as they used to be, and they're not as fast as they used to be, and they want to start a church. Starting a church is hard when you're a young man. 
And so some people are moving ahead of God and some people move behind God. But part of maturity is you move at that same pace. You flow with the Lord. And it's very obvious when you, when you start to see things on a spiritual level. It's very obvious when someone's behind or ahead of God. You, you can see that quite clearly. From my point of view, I can see that quite clearly. You know, um, I was with a minister just the other just the other week, and they were whining at me. Ah, oh, God's done this to me, and God's put me here, and God's doing this, and he he, he just did, had no idea what God was doing with his life, none at all. He's supposed to be a minister. He had no idea what the plan of God for his life was, and I I just marked that as an immaturity. And I, I made a very clear note not to invite him to minister or speak at one of our churches, and he's now asking me to speak, and I'm going to say no because he's not. I don't, I don't want to put a child in front of you to feed you. I want to put mature people in front of you to feed you people who can identify when God's moving because they're the kind of people who can then flow in the spirit and they can move with the spirit and that they, they can minister. And the, you know, sometimes, well, I've got my message all prepared and I, I spent hours preparing this message for you on Sunday morning and God goes a different direction. I want you to start flowing the gifts or God wants to give more time to the worship or God wants to let someone share a testimony. And some pastors can't do that because they can't identify where God's working because they've got no flexibility. They've got no ability to flow with the spirit. So these are the hallmarks of maturity. So by saying all of this, and a lot of people said it's clear and, you know, reminding them of stuff, okay, every one of us should be able to use that little grid I've just given you, okay, to locate yourself. And again, remember, if you say, you look, I'm, I'm immature in that area, don't get condemned, desire the milk and grow, grow. This is sometimes important to know yourself. The Bible says examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Okay. Now the problem is a lot of self-examination in Christian history has been this, you know, you're, well, you're not a terrible person just because you haven't sorted out a certain area yet. Go and sort it out. There's no moral judgment on this. It's just about growing up. But the, the, where, where it's terrible, where, where you become a bad person is when you realize, look, I'm really mature in that area. And you think, I don't care. I don't, I'm not going to do anything about it. Or you pretend you are mature when you're not. And you say, well, I know I'm, I'm better than that. And you start judging others and pulling others down. Well, that's, that's how good you, no, 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 no. Start to deal with it. Start to grow. And again, you can be mature in one area. You can be really mature in one area. Just have an area where you're immature. Lots of, lots of Christians have one or two areas where they just seem to struggle. And so what do we do? We find out what the word of God says in that area and get into that area. And we sort that out. Awesome. Praise God. Awesome. Well, has anyone got any questions? There's no questions at the moment. Um, I'm going to wrap this up now. Um, next week, I'm going to talk about wisdom, wisdom and maturity. Okay. When we learn what the word says, we get the wisdom of the word, we mature. And I'm going to put the two together for you. Okay. Um, going once, going twice. Um, maybe people are typing in questions. I don't know. But if you've got any questions, let me know. Um, otherwise, you know, d d don't just take this and go, that was a good message. Think about your life. What's the most immature area of your life? Face it head on. Okay. And what does the Bible say about this? Do a Bible study. Use all the information we took from the exegesis course the last 10 weeks and do a Bible study and find out what the word of God, do a topical Bible study, find out what the word of God says about that area and memorize it and learn it and feed on it and meditate on it. And suddenly that weakness can be one of your strengths. You know, Jesus Christ took the scars by his stripes you're healed. When they beat him and beat him, that made him weak in that area. That they, they, they took a whip and they whipped Jesus back, made his back weak. And areas in which we're punched and punched and punched makes us weak. Areas in which we're dealing with stuff all the time can make you weak because you're just coming against it. Some of you were, you know, abused as children in different ways. It made you weak. Some of you were given bad ideas as a child. It made you weak in certain areas because you had bad examples. Your culture doesn't understand the area or whatever. Wouldn't it be great if that by those stripes where you were beaten and made weak, you could then find healing for yourself and then bring healing to others. So don't get upset about the immaturity. Rejoice that this is going to be something where you're going to not just get yourself sorted. Get yourself sorted out first. Don't try and go and sort everyone else. Don't, go, don't, go, don't, go, don't sort the world out until you sort yourself out. Locate yourself. Do the Bible study. Learn. Feed. Get yourself sorted grow desire the milk of the word and grow this of course is not supposed to condemn anyone it's redemptive we're going to all grow up together we're all going to be more mature and we're all going to get exactly where god wants us to be amen awesome praise god wendy's asked me to summarize the main points so i'm assuming she's meaning the points from the location so babies innocent they've got no past that's a good thing ignorant they'll put anything in their mouth irritable they get upset easily I say you tell a baby, 
innocent, ignorant, irritable. What about children? Instability. Up, they're down, they're here, they're there. Oh yeah, pastor, I'm 100% behind you. 200 miles right behind you. Oh, I love this church, we're going to this church forever. Sorry, we just don't feel it anymore, we're off. Inquisitive, they want to know everyone's business. Don't mind their own business. And incessant, they just keep going on about things that don't matter. They don't understand how to prioritize. And then maturity, immune to praise and criticism. That could be two points, really, but it's the same thing. It's other people's opinions, good or bad. Immune to praise or criticism. Ignoring sense knowledge, walking above the knowledge of your senses, walking in the spirit and identify the work of God. You know where God's moving. You know what God's doing. You're not running ahead of God. You're not behind God. You're in the right place at the right time. Awesome. Nine points, all beginning with letter I. Yeah, that was awesome. Praise God. Okay. Love you guys. Uh, no more questions coming in. No questions coming in. Love you guys. So we'll see you next week when we talk about the wisdom and maturity connection. Um, tonight I'm in Trimley. Watford's on tonight as well. So there's two in-person services. There's a couple of families away in Trimley. Normally we're basically turning people away in Trimley. It's full. Um, but there's a couple of families away on holiday this week. So if you want to come along to Trimley, hear my message on doubt. It will be a great time. Chris and Bonner leading worship. So that would be a great evening if you want to come to that. You're more than welcome. And then tomorrow morning, Sunday in Dagenham, Sunday morning in Guildford. And then in the evening we have Brentwood, Croydon and Dorset. What a service we're putting on for you guys. It's going to be a glorious, glorious weekend. Say hello if you're in the same place as me anywhere. Love you all. See you all soon. Bye.